What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Today is going to be a pretty long one. We got a few things to go over. Uh, we're not going to go over all the news that's come out since we've been gone because there's a lot, but we're going to so- certainly highlight the biggest uh, uh, newsworthy items that uh, deserve some dialogue. Brian, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Had a nice, uh, a nice holiday, busy holiday. It's still kind of ongoing. Feels like it's, I don't know. It feels like in my world, it's more like the 12 days of Christmas. As opposed to Christmas <laughs> yeah, at this right. Age with the kid, but um, but they had a lot of content, lot, lot to cover. And uh, I don't know how was your holiday. Um, it was quiet. It was quiet. Same old, same old. You know, buying gifts and making sure. You get the right gift for your wife and things of that nature. So, you know, I have all those stresses, but it, everything's been uh, pretty calm and quiet like I like it. So I can't complain too much. That's good. Um, I know everybody knows that the Matrix came out and there was certainly for some, some excitement to see this film. And for others, like I said before in one of our episodes, this is a remix to me um brian you got a chance to see it i want to hear the famous spoiler free review brian schultz version tell me how did you like this movie and what did you leave with feeling about the matrix franchise first off i think the matrix has our cameras today so just in case You know, so I saw this movie, I actually went with the HBO Max option just because I wanted to see it on the 22nd, right when it came out, because I was traveling later that day. And I am going to go to the theater to see it again, but not for the same reason that I'm going to the theater to see Spider-Man No Way Home again. I'm going to see No Way Home because I want to just enjoy the ride as many times as possible on a big screen before they, they take it off the big screen. want to go see this movie on the big screen just to see if watching it again with like bigger everything bigger if it's as jarring as it was to me watching it on hbo max i have no real words for what this is um remix is not a bad place to start but it's the meta remix is kind of how i would massage your description This is one of the most meta films I've ever seen in my life. And it hits you over the head with it instantly. So here's things I can tell you to expect, I think, without giving away content. You will see a lot of footage from the original three movies. I don't mean a flashback of two seconds. I mean, you're going to see the movie playing in the background of the movie. Because the characters now in the new version of the Matrix, I think I can say this without giving being too specific, they act as if they are aware, almost like audience members of the original trilogy. Yes. Which is just bizarre. Yeah. And I think the line that I can say, and you, it, it will still have the same effect on you when you see it, there is literally a line in this movie between an exchange between Keanu Reeves and you know our, one of his antagonists, where the antagonist says, Warner Brothers is going to make a fourth one of these with or without us. That line is in the movie. Not as a joke, like spoken in the movie. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, they, they <laughs> literally wrote in the movie basically what was the origin of this film, which sounds like it was going to happen, whether the initial act, the original actors and directors were going to participate or not. And then this output becomes like the response and commentary on them. A lot of this script seems intent on sort of poking fun would be generous. I think it's like taking a very cynical, like, hot shotting at the notion of sequels and reboots. There's another scene, which is literally like a brainstorming 
how to make a new matrix something mm -hmm. in which they they're like what made the original they literally have a discussion where it's like what made the original matrix so special and they have all these like they have this like team of engineers and writers basically like throwing stuff out and then they literally settle on the phrase bullet time they say bullet time like four times uh, and i'm just like it's so like mind-bendingly just almost awkward and weird you're like what what is that like what am i actually watching to where when they actually kind of launch you into what is ostensibly the new actual narrative of this story it just didn't work for me um i just it, it not it had it's not that it hadn't lost me i just was kind of turned off by how blunt this approach to remixing the franchise was um keanu is definitely john wick in matrix form mm -hmm. i think what you saw in the trailer is what yeah. he brings um i think if you are looking for kind of the the next groundbreaking fight scene in the matrix franchise your search will continue <laughs> um and i think it's interesting because th this movie was choreographed by the people who choreographed john wick not the people who choreographed the original matrix and yeah. i think that kind of shows it, it looks like that yeah. he looks like that he moves like that yeah. and his powers are much more like how he was it's almost like how yeah, he was in Reloaded and Revolutions, but minus the Kung Fu. Yeah. Um, he's almost more like Doctor Strange in a weird, weird way. Like he's kind of like sorcerer more than he is a ninja. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that. I don't know if it's because of his age or or what have you. Although in John Wick, he's pretty physical, so I don't yeah. know. I have a choice there. I feel like we're getting at a point where, you know how, for, I'll give you a great, a great example: Antonio Banderas. And perhaps even John Claude Van Damme, we got too much of these guys at once. And they seem to be the same guy in each of their films. Are we getting too much Keanu Reeves at this point? Are we getting almost like, you know, fatigued with his, his uh, I guess, his, uh, I guess, his, the movies that he's doing? Um, well, but I see, I think of the Keanu that's in the original Matrix movie in particular has a much different affect than John Wick does. Mm -hmm. You know, the Keanu Reeves in that movie is very much like a fish out of water. Um, but once he develops his skills, he's very smooth, right? He moves very smooth. The core, the yeah. wire work is very good. Like he, he makes you believe that he can, he can perform mm -hmm. those, those acts yeah. at speed. Whereas John Wick always had this feel of like the older been through hell down on his luck guy who's kind of just beaten up but you know he's got this dogged determination and he's really quick with a gun yeah but like he was always limping around and kind of beaten up and like neo never had that characteristic okay and so to bring that into this franchise i think was just a, a poor decision it's not a good fit and the way they try to sell it to you is not really believable. Um, and I just have to think, honestly, like maybe that was just a condition of Keanu coming back, which he was just like, I'm not going to, you know, weirdly though, he does spend time with, you know, seemingly bald and shaved again, like he was in the real world of the original mm -hmm. movie. So I'm kind of like, well, why didn't you just kind of re remix your Matrix look? Why did you just bring mm -hmm. the John Wick look? In? Yeah. So I think it was more choice than anything else. And it just doesn't work because I think part of what made these movies great, obviously, was the, the martial arts and the, the wire work. And I think this ironic because, like I said, they literally have a brainstorming session about what made Matrix cool. And they actually failed to include one of the main elements that made Matrix cool, which was yeah. the fights. Yeah. Um, so I think that's that was disappointing. Uh, I think the part that, you know, the part that sort of, there's some performances that I think are interesting. Like I think, you know, Neil Patrick Harris is, is he's not bad. Like he's, he's a little, he's a little different. You know, when you find out what he's yeah. up to, it's, it's, an, it's somewhat of an interesting take. Jessica Henwick, I think is her name. She is the blue haired female. Yeah. She was an iron fist, right? She, yeah. So she continues her trend of 
being like one of the better parts of something that's not very good. Yeah. Um, in this movie, I think she's actually a pretty good character, but sort of underutilized. And I would like to have seen her actually fight more and do more. Yeah, yeah, it's completely wasted. I honestly have no idea why there is a character named Morpheus in this movie. And I have no idea why Lawrence Fishburne wasn't asked back, other than unless there was beef or unless there were money issues. Mm -hmm. um, because having the young, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not spoiling anything because Yaya himself has tweeted out that he's the younger Morpheus. Mm -hmm. It's like, he's revealed to be this and you're like, oh, that's cool. This is going to be like something new and different. And then he kind of winds up being like the fourth or fifth build character with not that much to do. Yeah. Um, so I, I just feel like it was like they wanted to have the callback to some of these names, but didn't want to bring back the original cast in all cases. And I'm sort of like, well, why? Yeah. Um, there's tie-ins with all three movies. Some of them work better than others. There's definitely some tie-ins to revolutions that are just a major force, but like, you kind of feel like they had, they had to do it the way they were going. Carrie Ann Moss is still great. Uh, I think I think one of the shames of this is, um, you know, she kind of gets one big, I don't want to call it a swan song, but she gets kind of like one big sort of run as Trinity again in this movie. And you're sort of like, why, why can't we have more of that? That she, <laughs> she still still rocks when she, you know, kind of turns it loose. So, um, you know, so that was kind of nice to see. And they, they do have some chemistry. So that was nice to see. But the other thing that was really stunning to me was the visuals in this movie. It's not super evident in the trailer, but you pick up on a little bit. So apparently it's Lana Wachowski that did this one. Yes. She apparently uh, picked up visually, like she's doing a little bit of the Chloe Zhao, like I want to use natural light a lot. Okay. And so a lot of the action is at like sunset or it's at night. But if you remember in the original trilogy, they made night very green yes so it was very bright and so everything looked green looked clear looked bright this was basically like i'm gonna shoot it at night like for real yeah, yeah. and it's just dark and confusing and you can't really see what's going on and so that's part of the reason i want to go to the theater and be like is it better like is it clearer if i watch this on a big screen because some of it was just like this kind of just looks it reminded me almost like uh one of my least favorite parts of captain marvel is that like I've seen they do at night with the night vision, yeah. which I think is terrible. And like, you can't even see what's going on. Yeah. And this movie had a lot of that. And I was just like, you guys know better. Than you guys, you shot the entire trilogy at night, basically the first time. Like, why are we, why are we messing with that? So, yeah. um, <laughs> would you recommend this movie to people who don't like the second and third films of the matrix and love the original? Uh, well, uh, I don't think I'd rec this, recommend this movie to anybody. <laughs> um, let, well, let, let's put it this way. I don't really understand how you actually would piece this movie together if you hadn't seen the first three. As I said, and the reason you know that is they play so much of the first three. It tells you that like this movie can't really stand alone. Um, so it's not going to bring anyone new to the franchise. But I think for people who idolized the first movie and were frustrated by the second and the third movie, I think this is a new low, personally. I think it like takes the things you didn't like about the second and third one and gives you like a new angle. It's not a repeat of that. It is different. Like, I'll, I'll give it that. It is definitely trying something different, um, but in a way that I just feel like both visually and narratively doesn't get there. Um, and what do you think the business decision behind this, behind greenlighting this film? What was the hope of Warner Brothers? What was it trying to accomplish with the greenlighting a film that if you ask most people, they'll say their 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 response to um, making this movie is why? Well, I actually think it's like I said, you know, when when they were doing the promotional material, Lana Kowski, who's notoriously um, reclusive offered up that the reason why she did it and her sister did not is because their parents passed away and so writing this script became like the catharsis for that okay. but having seen the which i was like okay I, I sort of get that as a creative that makes sense but then as i saw the movie and i told you about some of these meta commentaries in the script it felt a lot more like they've been under pressure for years to do more with this IP and they've said no, and they've said no. And now the studio was like, we've got HBO max. We've got these other avenues, you know, 
we're going to do this whether you like it or not, which is what's in the movie. And so she did it to kind of almost head them off and prevent them from kind of bastardizing the franchise in a way that she didn't want. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I feel like she wound up doing the same thing, just, you know, in her own way. Um, so I actually think it just had more to do with Warner Brothers was desperate to mine this IP further because it had sat there for a while. Mm -hmm. And they probably threw enough money at it to where like the key people were like, all right, we'll do another one. And so you get something that's really different, but it's really a mess. And I, I just, Your I don't score. know the franchise is dead, but I think that I was going to ask you about franchise that. with these characters, I don't know has any viable future. Yeah. What's your, so what's your score? Out of five, obviously. Uh, one and a half. Wow. That's pretty bad. This makes me not want to see it. This makes me want to catch it. Like there's absolutely nothing else on TV. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I mean, I wish I could even tell you, like, there's some mind blowing stuff that like you need to see on a big screen. And like I said, I'm more going to see like, if I can just decipher some of it, yeah. um, there just is not, you know, like I said, there is nothing that approaches the dojo fight scene, nothing that approaches the subway station fight scene, nothing that approaches the, the lobby of the building or the, or the top of the building, like, nothing like yeah. that. There's nothing yeah. like that in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, like I said, I'm not, the re only reason I say that I'm not convinced the franchise is totally dead is just because like the idea of what it is, you constantly reboot and have different characters. Part of me almost feels like this this series would do itself a favor if it went more the animatrix way it kind of yeah. like broke away from the neo character and the morpheus character and the trinity character and just used yeah. the landscape of the world to try yeah. to maybe build something new maybe yeah. there's something there in the right hands that could be kind of interesting but they're gonna have to let it breathe again after this movie i think i don't think if you did that next year yeah i i think um it's gonna be a while before we see any new content i mean i'm pretty sure they're gonna this this movie costs quite a uh, quite a bit of money and pr they may not profit from this i'm not sure if that is if you think that'll be the case brian well i think the theatrical run is clearly going to be poor i mean the numbers have already been pretty weak i think they were less than half of what the studio was hoping for um, yeah. you know, part of that's no way home is, you know, the runaway freight, freight train that everyone yeah. wants to see. But the other part of it is this movie didn't give you enough of an alternative to really have to go see it in the theater. So I think you're mm -hmm. going to do it. I think you're going to get a pretty good audience in HBO max. I mean, this is the kind of curiosity type thing that people will want to tune in for. Um, but I, 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 I question whether everyone who tunes in is going to make it to the end or care enough to make it. To the end. Um, yeah. it, it just is not. It just doesn't hook you in nearly the same way that the original one just kind of grabbed you instantly um, and, and never let you go. And this, this really doesn't have that. And the moments where it's kind of interesting, it just never kind of feels fulfilled. And then the nostalgia doesn't quite get there because like I said, they just, you know, they don't, they, they kind of lose the essence of those like great fights and action set pieces that really define the first trilogy uh, or even the, especially the first film, even to a lesser extent, the second one. Um, so yeah, no, just, uh, I was, I went in with pretty modest expectations and I would say I was definitely underwhelmed, but I was more just almost shocked at like what I was watching. <laughs> so, uh, so if you're going to watch it, I would say, watch it with like kind of a train wreck mentality, like go in, like wow. expecting, just go in expecting something really weird and try to just detach yourself from the original film in particular. Yeah. Well, there you go. For those of you who um, have not seen the film and are thinking about seeing the film, there's your review. You might skip it. You might still be curious enough to want to watch it because you were a fan and you just want to see what they've done. And that's fine as well. But for me, I again, I'm not going to make any... I'm not going to pencil in any time to actually um, see it at, from home anytime soon um, unless my wife wants to see it and then else. who knows maybe new year's eve i don't know maybe we'll see but there you go next up man 
Hawkeyes, uh, Disney Plus Hawkeye finale um, was last weekend. I'm sorry, last Wednesday. And certainly a show that we were very much looking forward to seeing, um, especially me. I was looking forward to seeing very specific things. Um, Brian was totally right on with his prediction on Kingpin being a, a major uh, character in this last episode. Um, let's talk about what we felt about the last episode of Hawkeye. Brian, you know that for the, since episode three, four, and five, we've been totally uh, happy with what they they were able to accomplish with Hawkeye. Um, it was a show that we weren't necessarily looking, for, not looking necessarily looking for, but we didn't think it was going to be a strong showing. And episodes three, four, and five really changed my mind as far as what I consider to be, you know, uh, one of the better shows when you look at the Disney Plus shows that we've seen so thus far. And I think you and I can both agree that this sometimes they 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 do a good job with ending a series and and sometimes they don't and this in particular was one of those uh, series that didn't really end well for me. Brian, could you talk a little bit about what didn't you like about what you liked and what you didn't like? I'll definitely talk about what I um, I'll do the same but I liked less than what I did. Um, what were your thoughts on, on this finale? Uh, yeah, I think we had similar reactions. I think we were both very disappointed in this. Um, it, it really had a lot of the same issues that Marvel has had landing the plane. It, it really reminded me in particular of the Falcon and Winter Soldier finale where you went in off this this high of the week before, but you also were like, wait a minute, there's a lot in the air, a lot of balls in the air here. So for a show that had no definitive season two, how are we possibly going to wrap all this up? Yeah. And I th think at first we got a little excited because we got the word that the finale was an hour long, 59 yes. minutes. But I think it became apparent pretty early in this episode that they had bitten off more than they could chew. And, uh, a lot of these things felt rushed, forced, and I think also just some, you know, for a show that I would say relative to the other Marvel shows, this was pretty consistent. Like for me, you know, I know, I, I think I liked episodes one and two maybe a little more than you did. So I kind of mm -hmm. felt like this whole show, like episodes three and five were like A-level episodes. Yeah. But I felt like the worst episodes were kind of like BB plus episodes. Like I didn't feel like there was any duds yeah. in this show. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I feel like the finale was kind of a dud. Like I feel like it was Man. the weakest episode of the six by a good margin. And that's yeah. never where you want to be as a show. Yeah. Um, we can get into a couple of reasons why, but you know, what maybe take it by characters. Do you want to start with the obvious one? Because this sure. one hurt this one hurt us personally. Yeah, yeah. I mean the kingpin. Yeah, let's talk about the kingpin. For me, it's you know I was like, oh man, so they're gonna do they're gonna do this. When I saw him immediately, when the show started, I was like, okay, they're gonna do this. All right. So I was I was on board with what I was seeing, Brian. His same similar, similar speech pattern. You know, I was hoping nothing none of that would change. Some of his the seriousness of the character. I wasn't hoping that was uh, I was hoping that wasn't gonna change. And and we were doing well. Um, I think what bothered me the most, Brian, about the Kingpin was towards the end. That's what really bothered me the most. I was fine with the beginning parts because you, you, you saw how you saw what he was, he was living up to the, the fear that Hawkeye had in dealing with this individual. In the beginning, towards the end of it, though, it just, I was like, listen, if you want to do comic accurate stuff, fine, but be careful how you do it, though. 
um even even you don't even sometimes have to go frame by frame in terms of using specific clothing you, you can do all that for certain situations but not with the kingpin when i saw him in the hawaiian shirt in, in the, the 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 fedora to me he i mean the word goofy started popping up into my head and to have him fight kate bishop and they had him doing too much in this episode. You don't get to fight the kingpin, fight uh, uh, Kate Bishop, a sidekick. You have that person fight the kingpin. Not these bigger superheroes like Spider Man, Daredevil. You have him coming out there. And. I mean, I, the, the final scene too. I understand you want to, you know, there was a bit of fan service. That was straight, it was a straight out the comics, right? Yeah. But that was just done too early, man. I don't know. What did you think about the Kingpin in that last in that final scene and the fact that he was fighting Kate Bishop? Yo, they had him just doing too much, in my opinion. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you 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 hit on you hit on several of the key. So to me. The initial exchange, we got off to a decent start. Like we saw him, he has the initial exchange with Eleanor Bishop. And I was like, okay, you know, that, that, that brings us forward from the photo. We are setting up something very personal is about to go down here. And, you know, Clint Barton is going to get caught in the middle of it. And we're, we're going to have sort of a, some sort of resolution of whatever his past with the Kingpin was. So I was like, all right, that's kind of what I thought we would do. And that's how we started. Where the, the, the first warning sign to me, where I immediately was, I, I literally just cringed when I heard him say the line. D'Onofrio said the line, and I'm going to get the words a little bit wrong here, but he said, this city needs to be reminded that it belongs to me. Yeah. And I immediately said, well, wait, wait a minute. Why does the city need that? This <laughs> is a personal battle. And if you yeah. were going to... If you were going to launch a citywide offensive, you ain't sending no tracksuit mafia to execute that. So immediately I was like, oh no, this is, they've got the wrong stakes yeah. and the wrong battle. Yeah. And he, in that monologue, focused more on like fleshing out his history with Clint Barton or Ronan. That's where this, and, and said, Okay, if you want to get him physically involved, which I think is a, that's kind of a questionable decision, but like, if you're going to do that, I think if you set the stage as, look, here, here's why this particular guy, I hate him so much, <laughs> and I've had to tolerate him, this uneasy alliance, and now he's crossed me so I can take the gloves off. Yeah. And he, had you done something like that, where it wasn't about some grandstanding display at Rockefeller Center and you just said like I'm coming for that guy and his family okay I'll watch that yeah. but that doesn't disturb the tenor of the show but when it was like hey we're gonna I'm gonna send my low-level goofy hoods to try to take out this like event <laughs> I'm like man the kingpin's not that dumb that's not what he would do mm -hmm. uh, so that was mistake number one you hit on mistake number two this whole show has been set up as like Hawkeye well, I'll get to it. Sorry, I misspoke because Hawkeye, I think, is a misnomer. Ronan's had history with Kingpin, and we never got that fleshed out because yeah. Kingpin never stood face to face with Jeremy Renner. Yeah. Yeah. Which is stunning. Yeah. Me. Considering Renner, it was Barton saying all the time, I'm worried about this guy. <laughs> calling his wife, I'm worried about this guy. <laughs> well, good news, Clint. You didn't have to see him because your little, your little protege took care of him for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was an absolute storytelling just fumble. How could the, someone in the room not have been like, excuse me, the word, we just spent five episodes yeah. working on one conflict yeah. and they're not, and we have Vincent D'Onofrio and Jeremy Renner in the same show and they're never going to be face to face? Yeah. 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 Job is what I keep hearing from other people. They're like a WrestleMania job. Yeah, jobber. Yeah. Kind of what? Is, yeah. So then the third thing is, the physical, right? So then he fights. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, he clearly is much bigger and stronger than, than Kate Bishop. Mm -hmm. um, but 
that style of fighting that worked really well in the Daredevil Netflix show, like especially at the end of season three, right? When he's, they're in the, they're in his house or whatever. And he's, he's tossed, you know, he kills Bullseye, spoiler alert. And he's tossing Daredevil around. Like it really works in that show. In this setting, it kind of, it felt a little more clumsy. Yeah, and yeah. the notion that Kate could effectively incapacitate him as easily as she did yeah. just kind of defies belief. Yeah. Um, so I understand they're trying to graduate her into the Hawkeye mental, which is kind of what the show ultimately was all about. We'll get to that more in a bit. But I just, yeah, it, it just, it didn't seem, if you're going to have Kate Bishop fight him, it, it almost would have to end with her getting bailed out or rescued in some way. There's no way yeah. that, she, that she would walk out of the room and he'd be face down, which is what happened. Yeah. Um, the echo piece didn't bother me as much just because I recognized what it was. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think some interesting things come after okay. in the comics when this happens. And okay. so I think there's, if they follow it, which D'Onofrio, you know, he's saying the right things about wanting to keep going, but not being sure. I heard it. I heard a, a, an interview with Reese Thomas, who was the director of the last episode. And he was very quick to say, look, that scene is meant to be a question mark. Um, in the comics, Kingpin loses his vision. So, and in fact, that he says, remember, family sometimes doesn't see eye to eye. Not eye, yeah. So I think he's clearly been shot in the eye. He loses his vision. He actually remain he remains a villain even though he's blind, which creates this interesting parallel with Daredevil, who's obviously blind. And then he has this experimental surgery to get his vision back and kind of retakes his criminal empire. I'm here for that. I feel I feel like, I feel like if mm. they want to do some of that arc, I think there's some interesting stuff there. So that part actually didn't bother me, but I think they'd already lost me with him kind of being beaten up and limping out. And you know, it just yeah, it, it just was a shame to feel like such a powerful potent character just kind of committed so many rookie mistakes and got kind of hoodwinked in this in this one episode to where you're left feeling like this guy's not such a big deal why why did why, why did the event why does any avenger yeah. care about this dude yeah like, so yeah oh by the way i mean um in daredevil the show he actually breaks uh, Bullseye's back and the, there's a cut scene, I believe, or a credit scene where they're operating on putting the animant, supposed to be animantium in his spine. So, but that was the end of that. So we're, we're never going to see whatever transpires after that. But um, yeah, man, the king, for me, the kingpin, you know, had his moments in the beginning and then just totally like, I felt disappointed at what they tried to do it was just too soon too much and uh, let's see what happens after this um so can we talk about renner for a second yeah that's what we asked for. i was going right now hawkeye yeah, there were certain things that i was expecting from jeremy renner and again, this is these are these are one of those moments where the star of the show doesn't feel like the star of the show. Um, I had expressed a scene um, with Yelena that I thought would be a little bit more heart wrenching. In that, you know, he was going to have to face Yelena and tell her what happened on Volmir. He, and based on what we saw, he didn't really get into too much of that he told and and he sp spoke about what we thought um obviously that you know him and natasha have spoken about yelena and N N natasha really um gave intimate details about her life and and with her sister and everything like that um i think that was that was also an opportunity for clint barton to to reveal to the audience how Natasha knew that Yelena was the one that was snapped and the, and the reason why she made that sacrifice, that could have been an aha moment for everyone to realize because, you know, you sort of left, you just figure that Natasha wants to do it because a probably the, the, what she's done in her career as a black widow. And one of those moments being that she regrets the most is, is, is Dracov's daughter. Um, but it doesn't, I think it was just a missed opportunity there. 
Um, what well, for me, that was probably pretty much the whole thing. Um, um, and I, they just could have done more. And I think they just phoned it in for that episode. What were your thoughts on Hawkeye's, um, um, on Clint, um Jeremy Renner's performance and the character of Hawkeye in that last episode? Yeah, he's just, you know, I think, I think we got to the end of the show and I, I kept describing him as a facilitator. And I think it sort of dawned on me and maybe I'm just slow to realize this, but the show is not called Hawkeye because of his Hawkeye. It's because it's called Hawkeye because of the man of Hawkeye passing yeah, okay. him okay. to her. Got it. And so I think we got to the end of the show and I, you were like, yeah, it really was about Kate Bishop's ascension. And Renner was, you know, he was more like Mark Hamill in The Last Jedi. <laughs> Um, yeah. he was kind of there to there to kind of usher her along but he really wasn't there to to take center stage and i kept waiting for him to do it i thought this would be the episode he never really did it and i and that just led me to the conclusion of that's the way jeremy renner wanted it maybe it was less little less work mm -hmm. um maybe he felt like it was it was a good way for him to kind of switch from being like a frontline avenger to being sort of a supporting character but yeah no i think the way he's treated in this episode and the way he, his part plays out, there's very little of the Avenger side of him. That's on the, he makes a couple of cool shots, I guess, but you know, he's not really showing off that much of his, his archery skills. Um, the thing that bothered me the most, actually even more than the Elena thing, which I'll get to, is uh, I, I didn't really feel like the show tied off the Ronin history. Uh, you know, he burns the suit at the end kind of like... I'm good and I'm at peace and I've fixed everything, but I'm like, we really kind of didn't, you know, we didn't really fully flesh that out in part because you didn't meet the Kingpin. Um, and so it felt like some of these sins of the past kind of didn't really get, you know, fully tied off for me at least. So I don't know, that, that felt sort of incomplete. And then the Elena thing, I mean, I texted you, it kind of immediately reminded me of, you know, the whole Martha exchange and Dawn of Justice mm -hmm. where it was like, this moment of recognition between two people who should be on the same side, but like the thing that draws them together seems just sort of unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, and this whole thing has seemed a little bit shoddy in the sense of, you know, we know Elena was tasked with killing Clint because Contessa gave her the picture, but like we never, we also never really got what else she was told about what happened on Vormir or how it played out. You know, and so I feel like that would have been useful information because that lie would have then opened the door for something that Clint could have used to disprove it rather mm -hmm. than what they did, which was the much more sentimental approach of like, I'm going to play on something like you're, I'm going to play on your emotions and I'm going to trigger something from your childhood that only yeah. like, you know, only people closest to Natasha would know. And I'm like, but if you're convinced that he betrayed her and killed her, then why would that change your view of that in an instant? Yeah. So I just, again, I, I didn't totally buy that. Um, when, you know, they didn't exactly have an epic fight leading up to it. She kind of just kicked his butt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, quite honestly, he had a better fight with Natasha in Avengers 1 when he was brainwashed. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah again, just didn't. And then, you know, he gets stuck in the tree, which is sort of comic relief. And uh, I don't know. It, it just didn't feel like he he had like his true... I don't know, his, his true shining moment. Um, so I, I, yeah, I was, at the end of the day, I was kind of, I felt let down that he didn't do more in the finale. And I felt like, like I said, the Ronin character, there's still questions and still things there that feel unresolved, but he's telling us they're resolved. So I guess we're supposed to believe him. Yeah. You know what bothered me too, man? And, I, and I, it's something that happens a lot in, these, these, I mean, you see, you see, seen it in Infinity War, and I, I understand you have to do it to sort of cover the entirety of the characters and what they're doing in in certain situations. But to me, I, I just I get turned off a little bit by the the constant cuts in between fights between whomever is fighting. You know what I'm saying? Um, just bothered me a little bit. Because if they were not wasn't doing anything impressive, and you know, other than the the kingpin fighting Kate Bishop was interesting, but not for a good reason. I'm like, I was sitting there in awe, and I'm like, I can't believe they're doing this. <laughs> you yeah, you know, I, 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 the the actions the action sequence I enjoyed the most was sort of the 
pseudo fight between Kate and Yelena. Yeah. Because that was shot side scroll through the building. They're clearly not trying to kill each other. Yeah. They're kind of want to be friends, but they like don't. Now, I actually enjoyed that the most. And I would say one of the big winners of the show was clearly like Haley Steinfeld's chemistry with Florence Pugh. Like yes. If you leave the show with nothing else, you're kind of like, well, I'm ready to see them in Young Avengers. Let's go. Um, but I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of the, you know, like the, the LARPers fighting and all, it just in Jack Duquesne, who never also never really got to do anything. He kind of was just like comic relief with a sword. We never really got to see this true swordsman on display. Mm. He, he easily dispatched some of the track suits, but like that wasn't saying much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it just, the action just felt like filler. Um, and it, it didn't really, it didn't really advance the, the show that much. Were you disappointed in Jack Duquesne or Ducard? I forget his Duquesne? name. Yeah, yeah no, I, was. Do, I, I, was, I was disappointed. Yeah. I was disappointed that he's in the show, but apparently has no history with Clint <laughs> Barton and doesn't get to really, he doesn't really get to show off being a true swordsman. Yeah. It, against it, it, Ronin. It, it, against Ronin, because that was yeah. the whole premise in the comics is that like Clint can't beat him. And yeah. then finally get, get is able to do it years later. Like that, the show was teed up to have that in there and they, they didn't do it. Yeah, and he just came off as goofy. Didn't you know, yeah. a guy that didn't know what was going on, and just having fun, or, or having fun, and and having the opportunity to use a sword or use a sword. You see, I, I would have, I would have actually liked the character better if he wasn't named Jack Duquesne. Yeah, you know, because like when you name him Jack Duquesne, you create the expectations. Expectations, yes. Him, right. So like, if you where you just say like this is a guy we're creating for the show, and he happens to have some sword skills, then I don't, I don't walk around expecting him, you know to unleash something incredible. Yeah. So it felt like a bit of fan service that was, yeah, not, not paid, not paid out. Yeah. Um, kind of the same with Grills, to be honest. Like, you know, you had that, like, yeah. Grills never got close to his comic yeah. fate. So it was like, well, why name the guy Grills? You could have named him anything. Yeah, I mean, I'm, well, I think there's obviously the assumption that, for me anyways, that they're going to use him in the second season of this, perhaps. And, and I, I'm most likely Clint Barton won't be a part of it um, at all, maybe. And Grills will suffer, um, will we'll go through his demise in that <laughs> second season. But, you know, he was a good character. I, I, you know, it just seemed... the. the He's a good character. He was still a good character. And yeah, no, if, they, I, if they if they didn't do anything to him now, they'll do it in, they'll do it to him at some point. And you know, I think they need to do it just because to me they set it up. They set it up. But I think they postponed it till the next iteration of this. Who knows if he shows up in the Echo series? Who knows what they're gonna do next? Um were there any other Things that you liked or disliked about specific characters, where you thought their um, uh, story arc was going to end up? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't like. I mean, Eleanor Bishop kind of just being arrested and shuffled off. I yeah, that was kind of like, whack, wasn't it? I mean, considering that like she's got this security firm, like I feel like that's another loose end that's got to get. You know, maybe that's got some payoff later on, but um, that was disappointing given the actress playing the role. I thought the whole Laura thing was a complete waste. Um, yeah. It was just an Easter egg. Okay, so she was mocking. She was Mockingbird. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Um, I don't necessarily think that Adrian Pelik is coming back as Mockingbird. I mean, I've seen that speculated, but I mean, the weird thing is like they made such a big deal about the watch, and then it kind of yeah. felt like it wasn't much to the watch other than it was a Shield property, and she yeah. wanted it back. Yeah. So like again, it just felt like a lot of these they wrote themselves into a corner. Again, this might have been a show that could have used, you know, episode seven, eight to, to get there with some of these things. But, you know, they, they made the choice to put all these storylines out there and then try to wrap yeah. them up in one hour. And, you know, I don't know that this thing's going to get a season two. I mean, the ratings, by all accounts, haven't been that great. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe I think, you know, you got the Echo show. So that might be where you could tie some of these up. Obviously, if you yeah. launched a daredevil franchise uh that that would be another place you could tie off some of these yes 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 but um yeah no it just it was it was very unsatisfying way to end the the marvel year it yeah kind of very disappointing it's kind of underscored how lucky we were with the loki finale and how hard that was to do yeah very disappointing man very disappointing 
Um, any last words before we move on? Um, no, like I said, I mean, the, the, my favorite thing is, is, is Kate, Kate and Elena. That's, I, I do think yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, we'll, we'll do our year in review, but I think it's been a, it's been a strong year for female characters in the Marvel universe that, that I, I feel like for what I, whether that's by design or not, mm -hmm. I feel like we leave 2021. I liked I like Haley Steinfeld's Kate Bishop. Yeah. Love Florence Pugh's Jelena Belova. Yeah. I think, um, Xu Chai Ling, Shang-Chi's sister is great. Uh -huh. Um, and, Shang and obviously sets up some very interesting stuff there. Um, so I kind of feel like we 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 did pretty well actually, and and obviously you can even throw in like the the next level up of someone like Elizabeth Olsen and and what we what they did with her character uh, I think was us, and then uh, what what was it? Sylvie as well in the Loki yeah, show. Yeah. So I feel like Marvel did really well with sort of introducing new new and strong and interesting female characters. Weirdly, yes. that's like one of the themes of this year. Um, but uh, yeah, just kind of a bummer that this show we felt like had a chance to really kind of make a run maybe at Loki with a great finale and instead kind of settles in more in the middle of the pack, I feel like for the year. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was doing great, man. It was doing great. And then it's just the air, just like, you, you know, you pop a balloon and let the air seep out. And it just, it's just like, ah, uh, as the longer it went on and where I, where things where I thought certain things would happen, didn't happen the way I thought it, should have happened or could have happened it didn't happen that way and they chose a more safe route uh in terms of wrapping this up and they missed out on an opportunity they missed out on an opportunity to do something um great um let us know what you guys thought of hawkeye the season as well as what you thought of the uh, the, the final episode Next up, man, we got to talk about, about No Way Home and the box office and some of the the end result of this film and what it has caused people to sort of uh, demand seemingly more out of this uh, movie that we just got in, I guess, the residuals. What do you think about this box office, man? Uh, it's, it's, you know, everywhere I look is being talked about it, you know, breaking 1 billion, obviously post pandemic, not even post pandemic during the pandemic and it being something that people are very high on, especially Amy Pascal. Somebody needs to, I, I, I think that's why I think Tom Holland keeps saying what he says, because he's telling Amy, you're chill. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to coming back right away to do another three films, chill out. And Amy Pascal is going to telling whomever that we, we have an, another trilogy in store or whatever with Tom Holland. What are your thoughts with the behemoth that was no way home? I think it's awesome. I mean, this thing is basically tracking to be one of the top five films in U.S. box office history. Mm -hmm. uh, the global will not get there. So obviously we talk about the limitations in Europe in terms of theater openings. Also, this movie has no China release date, uh, which is tragic. Yeah. But you're probably talking, as I said, you're probably talking about a movie that if this was 2018 or 19, would have been challenging that two billion dollar global mark, mm -hmm. and as yeah. it is, is probably going to yeah. get to like one five to one seven, which is astounding. I mean, that's an amazing number. So hats off to everyone. Wow, you know, for for making yeah. I mean, you're probably looking at something that's going to be seven hundred fifty to eight hundred million domestic, and then you know another seven fifty to eight hundred million overseas. Uh, that's kind of where you're you're headed to, uh, mm -hmm. and that's I mean that's amazing. It shows you the what an event can still bring people to the theaters and when they like what they see, they go back and see it again. And that's what this movie is. And it's, as I said, it's one of its greatest strengths is that it flies by it. You leave kind of, I think you leave on a high, you leave kind of feeling like you saw, you had fun mm -hmm. and it's, if someone's like, Hey, you, I haven't seen it yet. You want to go back? Like you're always, you're willing to go back. And yeah. so I think that's what you're, that's what you're feeling um, with this, with this film. So I, I think it just underscores the, trend in movies that you know, people treat the theater now kind of like 
you got to be like a must see concert. You know, you got to yeah. be like that top of the yeah. top for people to shell out, take the time and go sit in the theater. Yeah. Uh, but when they're, when they're interested, people come out in the same numbers, if not greater numbers than they always have. And yeah. this movie did it. Yeah. I, I, again, I have to sort of reiterate that in, before this movie came out, it was really, um, I really didn't think too highly of the film doing, uh, I didn't think too, I didn't think too highly of the film being a great film. I didn't think it was going to get there because of all the stuff that they had to put in this, this movie that they wanted to put in this movie. And I just don't see those type of movies having a good track record in terms of watchability. Right. If that's even a word. Yeah. No. But um, they, they were able to pull it off in, 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 I think a fascinating fashion. And, you know, you know, we came out of there like I was wild. I was, I was really wild. I was like, I, and I, I had to take a moment and just think about some of the things that I had just finished seeing and, and just looking at the things that they were able to pull off with some of the characters. And I think they did a fantastic job, especially with that, that sort of soft reboot of the character in that MCU world. It was just amazing to me. And it seems that people would agree with us if you listen to our last show in terms of being who the MVP of this movie was. Andrew Garfield, people want more of this guy. Ask Spider-Man. They want to see Spider-Man 3. They, you, you see it in the po in Instagram posts, on Twitter. They want Spider-Man 3. Amazing Spider-Man 3 with Andrew Garfield. And, I, and we said we wouldn't mind seeing it. Um, what, what do you think we had? Um, if, let me know if you think if we head in the direction, Brian. Do you think Andrew Garfield gets a third shot at this, uh, a third movie? Um, for the Amazing Spider-Man, that is a tough call. Uh, they're obviously into multiversal worlds, so it's very it's possible they can do it. It wouldn't disrupt anything. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it's tough. Sony doesn't have a streamer, obviously. So, and he's not going to do this on Disney Plus. So it doesn't. Yeah. You don't have that option, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you could say like maybe you could do something on the streaming service so this has to be a movie right now if they're going to do it yeah um i'm not sure well, i'll float an idea to you so the, the one, one of the things is is how do you introduce miles morales into the spider-verse of uh, live action spider-verse mm -hmm. i think there's been speculation that like if it occurs it wouldn't necessarily be in the way that into the spider-verse did it um it would be he would kind of be shepherded along by the incumbent Peter Parker, Spider-Man. What if they had Garfield do that? Mm. What, what if his role was not so much Amazing Spider-Man 3, but it was that in his universe, he becomes, because he's older now, he's 38. Yeah. The actor is 38. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a 40-year-old Andrew Garfield is the guide and the mentor for the young Miles Morales. And that winds up being the launch pad for Miles Morales's franchise in the Sony verse versus having Tom Holland do it where Tom Holland's still only 24. I agree with you. That would be, that would be great. Um, and in sort of ending, I mean, if you want to kill Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, you can do it in that. Film. So the reason I also thought of it was because this. The, so first off, I mean Garfield is. I was trying to think of the right analogy. It, it, it would almost be like, like what Garfield did in this movie. I, I want to say because obviously we have like a Kurt Warner biopic out right now. Mm -hmm. It kind of was like going from bagging groceries to reminding people like I can be an MVP. Yeah. Um. But if if he had been in the show for like 10 years prior to that. Like, it would be like, he was, he was an all pro and then he went to bag the groceries for yeah. a couple of years. And then he came back, mm -hmm. took the ramps to the Super Bowl. That's mm -hmm. kind of what he pulled off in this movie. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I thought was interesting was he, he describes a world where after the death of Gwen Stacy, 
he kind of goes dark. Yeah. Like he basically said, I stopped pulling my punches. I got, and this movie leaves him with that redemption, right? He gets that moment of, which he plays perfectly where he's, spoiler alert, saves MJ yeah. and does what he couldn't do with Gwen Stacy. And, and so part of me was like, there's something interesting there where if you send him back to his world with all of that history, but now with this new hope, yeah, there's an interesting character there. Yes, and, and, and an interesting journey. Um, is, is, is Andrew Garfield Spider-Man the guy that criminals are afraid of because he stopped pulling his punches? Is he hurting his... Uh... He made it sound like he was more like Batman. Yeah, like he, yeah, like he was really, like, really beating them up, and he's become this fearful guy because he doesn't want this to happen. Obviously, he doesn't want this to happen to anyone else, and he's taking out his frustration on every, uh, on all the criminals. So certainly, that would be an interesting sort of dynamic to see when he goes back, how his perspective has changed and how he's and, and the way he's doing things changes and. Yeah, we meet a Miles Morales and he sort of right. takes- and so he brings that to Miles, yeah. right? He brings the sins, like the, yes. the, the virtue and the sins, the rise and the fall, and then the redemption of being Spider-Man, which I think would be an interesting dynamic, potentially, if they did. Yeah. Listen, there's so many things that they can do. Hopefully they go about it the right way this time with Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, because I think he's still one of the best, if not the best Spider-Man, in my opinion. Although Tom Holland and Tobey Maguire were great as well. I was watching actually the, over the weekend um, Spider-Man 2. And it, it was, they were good Spider-Man, but for me, Andrew Garfield was was the best. And, and I hoped that Sony and Andrew Garfield come together and do something um, great. And this would be the opportunity to really introduce Miles Morales. Who knows if the MCU may be a part of that in terms of helping them make something um, that's good. That would be the hope, and I would think. But still, let's see what happens. And now, the movie, uh, the the people behind the movie are, are making an Oscar push. <laughs> I'd have to say, nice try. <laughs> I applaud, I applaud the, 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 the attempt, but this is not going to, I mean, if it gets nominated, it'll probably be because of how popular this film is and how big this movie was, how well reviewed this movie was, but not as best picture. No, Brian, it could happen. It could happen. No, I mean, I, yeah, that, that's a heat check. That's all right. You can you're you're entitled to do that when you when you deliver something that that's uh, as fun as this. But no, I mean I think right now, right, the genre basically has two nominees: Black Panther and uh, and Joker, and those couldn't be more different. Um, yeah, you know. But I think this movie this movie belongs on the shelf more with the Avengers films mm-hmm. and Civil War, just from the standpoint of the amount of characters that are in this, more than any of the solo pictures. Mm-hmm. And none of those have been nominated for any. I mean, I would argue that, you know, if any movie was going to get nominated, not just required, if it was going to get nominated of those movies, it would have been Endgame, and it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I just, if those didn't get nominated. I, I can't see, I can't see this getting nominated. I can't see any of the performances getting nominated. I know, I think like, you know, we talked about Garfield, we talked about Defoe. Those are probably the only two that would be in the conversation in the supporting category, but they're, yes. not, they're not, it's, these are not Oscar roles per se. I know yeah. that we've seen these types of roles get some recognition in the past, but I don't think either, I think their performances are great and they're great for what they're asked to do in this. I don't know that they rise to the level of Keith Ledger in the dark Knight, for example. I don't think either of them's quite at that level. Yeah. But they're going to try it. <laughs> they're gonna try but well, shoot if, after what a woman 84 tried it i mean everyone's gonna try it <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> well let's see that's gonna be a very interesting oscar i mean when do we get when do we usually get announcements after who's not asked to who's nominated uh it's a little later this i think like now they've been doing the oscars they did them like in the spring last year i did them like in april or whatever so we probably get the nominees in like January. Okay. 
I mean, the, the movie's out, it's eligible. It's yeah. eligible for this Oscar cycle. That's true. Um, I, I was trying to think of whether like any of the visual effects would even make, I don't know if they, they'd even get nominated. I, I'm going to, I'm going to say this is a fabulously entertaining movie that if it gets nominated for an Oscar, it's going to be either in VFX or sound and nothing else. Okay. I wouldn't be, you know, I, if, if Andrew Garfield got, Best supporting actor. Hey, listen, if um, what's it, Mahershala Ali can get an Oscar award for being in the movie for five minutes, Andrew Garfield can get this one. You don't know what movie I'm talking about? Uh, which, which, well, he's got two supporting actor. He got actors. one for being in, I think, Moon, Moon was it Moonlight. Moonlight. Yes. Well, that was the first one. Yeah, Green, yes. Green Book, he's in a lot. Yes, yeah, no, Green, yeah, he's a star. Um, but in Green Book, he was there for like five, ten minutes tops. <laughs> and he won an award. And Andrew Garfield did, I think, did a fantastic job, in my opinion. Um, that if he won it, I would not be mad at it. Uh, but yeah, let us know in the conversation below. Where do you see uh, things going with the Spider-Verse? Um, there's a lot of things in doubt whether or not Tom Holland is going to come back. He's talking like you know, he he wants to shift the the excitement over to other things. He wants a new Spider Man, huh? Uncharted, Uncharted franchise. Well, no, he, actually, he said that he wanted um, you know, to have a, a female Spider like Spider Gwen or Spider Woman. Yeah, I know. Um, I don't know how those things work out, man. Those things don't work out usually too well. We'll see. I think Batgirl will be the 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 the, the test. The test. Um, and that's something that's very interesting that I think we should talk about real quick. Um, but moving on to the Batman. Speaking and before of we get, Batman, yeah. huh? Speaking of Batman yeah, and Batman related yeah. topics, yeah, yeah. So. Before we jump into that, I just want to hear your thoughts on on what we are going to be getting from the Batgirl. Um, who's supposed? Oh, there's, there's there's rumor that Michael. Oh, is this, is this confirmed? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so it's confirmed that Michael Keaton is going to show up, and I think uh, Michael Shannon Zod. I don't. Know, is that that the case? Right. Uh, Michael Shannon Zod is confirmed. Is it confirmed for Batgirl? I believe so. Okay. It is he. I did see a notice that he was confirmed to be returning to the role. Uh, I so I don't know. Or, yeah, you're probably what, right. Then it probably would be Batgirl. I don't know what wait, we're I gonna it, get. Wait, hang on a minute. Was it Batgirl or was he in Flashpoint? Oh, sorry, Flashpoint. He's in Flashpoint. Yes. And so my only question there is: it new footage or is it like? Are we just gonna see? Yeah. Yeah, like Zod again. So that you know, Flashpoint. He's not in Batgirl. Yeah. Okay. So but Batgirl. So Keaton's. Oh, so Keaton is in um, Batgirl. Um, where? Like, I don't know where we're going with this. Where do you think we're going with this, Brian? And obviously, J.K. Simmons. I guess he's the the, the he's the his, J.K. Simmons is a Perry, uh, what's his name in, in Spider Man? Um, J. Jonah Jameson. Jane Jonah Jameson. And, and all three, ex, uh, I guess, exist except for Amazing Spider-Man, which we haven't, I'm pretty sure they'll put him in there as well, looking different. And he is Commissioner Gordon in the DC universe. Yep. Right? Um, where, where are we going with this, Brian? I don't know. Other than, you know, they te the, 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 the directors teased that the real Batman was going to be in this film. And then we find out Michael Keaton is added to the cast. Like I think if I had to guess, some of it is what you alluded to. They're expressing an awareness that you can't build this without having Batman somewhere, somehow. But it's, it's... there's a piece of me that's starting to wonder, are they stealing Batman Beyond and putting it in this movie in some form? Like some <sighs> whiff of that and just having you know, that girl will be Terry McGinnis. I hope not. I agree, but I'm just saying, like, how how would an older Keaton fit in this and have it actually make sense? Like, that's actually one of the few ways I can think of. Um, but I think more than anything else, I mean, obviously, from a bankability perspective, it just adds legitimacy and interest to the project. Who knows how big his role is, but, like, that's, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make sure this thing works. 
And so they're, you know, they're shelling out some money to the big guns to come help the cause. And, uh, and obviously Michael Keaton as Batman will drive interest. Yeah. So I, I hope it's, you know, hope it's not just, a, I don't think it's just a paycheck. He doesn't seem like a paycheck guy to me. Um, it's Keaton. Yeah, he doesn't, I mean, just to, to stay away from the role as long as he did to then all of a sudden be doing it like two or three times. I mean, I'm sure the money's great, but I'm just like, I feel like, he doesn't strike yeah. me. He, I feel like he could have done that at any point along the way. And uh, to do it now makes me think he, you know, he's even said, like, I feel, he's like, he's felt like he, he cracked the code on how he would play this character if he got a chance to do it again. So, mm-hmm. so I hope he has something good in store. I'm still very like TBD on this film, but obviously, yeah, yeah look, I mean, it works for us, right? You, you, you say Michael Keaton is in the film as Batman. You're going to, you're going to get a little more interested. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, uh, it, for me, more curious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, the Batman. More stuff has come out of what this movie is aiming for. Um, Brian, you sent me a, an interview um, with the team of the Batman talking to Empire. Um, and producer Dylan Clark, um, all in his shot. Yeah, he says he said as the first, not a quote, as the first standalone Batman in ten years. The hope is we can lay a foundation. I want to break this down. Lay a foundation that you can build stories upon. I've said this to Chris Nolan directly. Look, we're trying to be the best Batman ever made, and we're going to try to beat you. Uh, Matt interested. Matt is interested in pushing this character to his emotional depths and shaking him to his core. This is something that we have um, always, or at least one aspect, always wanted to see on film. And Matt Reeves is certainly um, going for that. And and Dylan Clark has re- just re- confirmed what we thought was the aim for this movie is to be the best be, best Batman we've ever seen on camera. And that is certainly where they're going. Uh, so far, what do you take out of this, um, this statement from Dylan Clark? Great. I mean, I'm glad that they're confident and they're glad that they're aiming high. I mean, I don't know that it is a, you know, I mean, is it a really a competition with the Nolan verse? Like we'll see, I mean, they'll be compared to it for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I think, I think everything we, we continue to see about this movie is fantastic. Like the thoughts they have, like the directions they want to go, like, I'm, you know, I'm here for all of it. I know there's a couple other things in the, in the article that I think are pretty telling, but you know, yeah, I mean, I think they, they understand the burden of what they're trying to do and the standard that's been set and, um, you know, can't wait to see the movie. And I think, you know, all the indications are, they seem to have found a lane that is, is distinct and new. And everything we see, every piece of footage we see looks great. So Yeah. Um, in the article that Brian sent me, it goes on and says, indeed, the film seems to bond, to bode something more akin to movies like Seven, which we've said in the past, and, and Prisoners, which I haven't seen, but I imagine what it would, um, who, who did Prisoners? Was it Denis? Denis Villeneuve, yeah. Okay. A darker, a darker nor take which Reeves is adamant about doing something special with. Um, quoting Matt Reeves, he says, I've only ever made each movie as a passion project. This even more so because when you know something has been done well before and is so beloved, uh, you can't just come in and sleepwalk through it. You have to shoot for something. We're trying to leave our mark on this. They're serious, Brian. They're serious about what this is what I like. Somebody's taking a perspective of Batman that is serious. It's not goofy. It's not like you, you, it's not out there, but it's more grounded and more like what we've spoken about in the past, Brian, that he, this, this kid went through something and he's become this, this, this Batman, this crazy person. Cause Batman is crazy. He's he's crazy about what he does. He's he's obsessed, and 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 we get to see what goes through his mind when when he makes a decision to become Batman and what he's doing in this movie. Um, he I think he goes on to say Bruce is on the on this nihilistic journey, 
and they're pulled apart. This is referring to Alfred. He's not going to be like cool with Alfred in the beginning of this. Right. So it's got to the point where they almost no longer talk. If they bump into each other in the corridor, it's a very icy and painful greeting. They almost live in separate worlds now. So whereas before we've seen Alfred being this father figure, the guy that supports him, the, the guy that got his back, the one has, you know, there to, to, to see his vision and to help him through it to someone, they're not on the same page. So Brian, we're going to be looking at the beginning stages of certain relationships that Batman has. Jim Gordon, his, and, and one of the most important relationship of Batman is him and Alfred, as well as Catwoman, as well as with, I guess, Gotham City and how he's going about doing what he has to do there. Brian, this sounds amazing to me. What are your thoughts? I completely agree. Um, I, I like the, so we're in year two. Mm -hmm. So that would imply Alfred and Bruce probably start out on the same page. And at this point, Alfred's kind of horrified by what he's seeing or, 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 you know, clearly loves Bruce, but is worried about the path he's on and as frustrated to the point where, you know, they're, he still works for him, but they're kind of on the outs with each other. Great. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen that before. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we saw Michael Caine quit in tears mm -hmm. in dark Knight rises but we haven't seen this sort of like active, you know, almost like I, I will, I will do my job, but I disapprove of what you're doing. And, you know, I'm standing my ground as, you know, Batman kind of continues on the path of, as he as Pattinson says in the trailer, I don't care what happens to me. Yeah. So I love that. Um, yeah. I, I, I love the fact that there's clearly a vision for the trilogy but they're just focused on the task at hand. Mm -hmm. that, 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 to me, that is always, that is always how these movies work best. Yes. It, you know, Pattinson has a quote in the same article, I think, or one of the same article where he talks about like, he, he already has kind of mapped out where he thinks he would like to take his Bruce Wayne portrayal in the next two movies. But the whole focus is like, got to nail this. Yeah. Right? We got to nail the first one. And then we can worry about that stuff later all these movies that come in thinking hey i got five or six of these mapped out and this is just they never make it they never make it mm -hmm. like even even marvel which had an idea for how to get to end game focused on let's get iron man on the board let's get captain america on the board mm -hmm. and then if we're lucky if we pull this off then we can swing at avengers and, and away we go everything i read from these guys is like they're treating this like we got one shot at this yeah and if we pull it off, then the door is open and we can do the stuff we want in yes, two and yes, three. Exactly. But we exactly. have to hit it out of the park with this. Yes. All good signs. It's what but, you want to hear. Don't make But not only just two and three, whatever is still building around um, this trilogy with the show Gotham, mm -hmm. um, the show that we might get. Um, well, I think that they are going to do this. Um, the one with um, the Penguin. And sort of, it was interesting to read where they got the, where uh, Colin Farrell got his inspiration. Fredo. Uh, Fredo. <laughs> right? Um, I guess a, a much tougher Fredo, but a one that has the chance to prove himself now that he's, uh, I guess, uh, ascending the criminal ranks, I guess. Um, all very interesting ideas and takes and, and this is obviously the most anticipated movie of 2022 not black adam uh not even dr strange although i am certainly looking forward to seeing what dr strange uh two has to talk about any last thoughts on the batman and by the way just uh, probably like 20 minutes ago um AJ sent me a new trailer uh, for the Batman, and it's called the Bat and the Cat trailer. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to see this after we get off this call. Well, there were rumors there was that they were another trailer, right? 
yeah, they were going to drop something in theaters around this time uh, that was new. I think the other thing that's been fascinating in this article is that it, I think you had said this to me, this idea that they're building this world that is inhabiting HBO Max and the theaters, but it sounds like they've been given free reign to not be part of the multiverse. Yes. So they can kind of, it doesn't mean they can't be connected to it later, but it just means they don't have to check any boxes Correct. for Warner Brothers as part of their story. What They, they can do their story the way they want to do it. Yes. And the studio is going to worry about the rest later. I think that's also a good sign. Let me ask you this. I, I've always said that this movie will be, I don't know what it was, but I felt like this movie would be the beginning of something. I don't know what exactly. It's, we're starting to get a bit of insight as to where they're going uh, and what they want to do. I, you know, we're getting these shows um, that are obviously connected to that world that Matt Reeves is building with the Batman. And with the trilogy, they're going to be the shows that th that comes out on HBO Max that we could sort of have to watch to get some context um, when this movie hits his third film. Um, do you think it ends there? What do you th what do you think we're heading with the Batman? Because listen, money talks, and when you do great numbers. That you know, obviously they got the trilogy in the bag that's happening. Hopefully, you know, the we already know that the numbers are going to be fantastic. Um, when when the money comes in, there's going to be talks of perhaps expanding this and doing more, because this is, I guess, sort of the thing that they need is to go in a different direction um, and stay true to the character, but also dive into the character as to who they, what they're going through mentally and really discovering who this character is in the Batman. Um, does this translate to other uh, future characters that they want to do in the future or do they continue to just do, let anybody do whatever they want with characters? Where do you think this is all going? Well, I I'm fascinated to see whether the tone and the motif that they've created for this one is allowed to carry through. Uh, it's, it's obviously very dark. If it is focused on the mystery and the detective angle, you know, the trailers have shown a decent amount of action. So I, I'm guessing we're not going to be starved for, for that. But if that's the direction they're going and the box office is what we think it can be, they will have definitely carved out a very different lane than the Nolan verse, certainly from the the Schumacher and the Burton iterations. So the question then is like, for your follow-up, do you, do you stay with that? Do you, do you really just kind of keep with this general idea that Batman is detective first, you know, kind of, or 1-1-A, he's detective and kind of troubled young soul. Yes. And, uh, and then the, the, almost the, the superhero aspect of it is much more secondary to that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fascinated to see because if it works, I think it's just it's just not something we've seen in this genre before. And I would love to see it carried through. Like we talk about comparisons to Seven, but like a movie like Seven was never meant to have like a sequel. You know, it's it's a it's it creates this world. You inhabit it. You wrap. You know, you end the story and and you kind of move on. Whereas here, you're creating this universe that like you're supposed to live in for potentially years and a number of projects. Um, I think it could be great. I just, it's just not something we've seen. Like, I think, you know, if Nolan, if Nolan's version in the end kind of, you know, he always makes a comparison to Heat and Michael Mann. And that's kind of what he did. He kind of created this sprawling city drama in which Batman was a, a central part. You know, if this is going to be like almost like a, a horror serial killer murder mystery version of Gotham, almost like the, I'm, I'm kind of always keeping reminding of like when they did, um, what was it, the Arkham Asylum video game? And that kind of redefined how Batman video games were. And then they built sequels to that, but stayed in that sort of general motif. That's kind of what I feel like this is trying to do. I'm a little worried that like, if it does great, the studio comes in and says, we need bigger, you know, we need <laughs> more explosions. And they kind of do a version of Donna Justice on it where you're like, nah, don't, don't take away the essence. If this works, just keep doing this. There's yeah. so many rogues in the rogues gallery. 
just have him solving mystery after mystery, you know, and, and then you can have the big reveals be these different classic villains that we know and love. And as long as they're played well, we don't have to have like 10 more explosions or 20 more vehicles for this to be great. Yeah. I think that the, the sign of things are heading down the wrong path will be if Matt Reeves gets replaced. Oh, oh yeah, so, for sure. But that, that'll know, definitely be a problem. Yeah. Then, then, especially if the movie does great. And then after that, if they want, if, if we hear creative differences talk, then, then this is all over. It's all over. If people um, forget, I mean, Reeves did, so Re, in the Planet of the Apes series, people forget Reeves did not direct the first one. He only directed okay. two and three. He came in and took over okay. two and three. Okay. And two and three are better than one. He definitely yeah. kind of launches the series forward. So I think he'll be back. And I think, you know, this whole stuff about the set, I mean, you hear Pattinson talking about like his future and wanting to do more with the character. I think he's fine to be back. I think all that stuff. If, yeah. he, look, maybe these guys don't send each other Christmas cards, but like if they put together something great that is well-received and acclaimed, they're going to get in a room and on set and do it again. Of like, course. It wouldn't be the first time that that's been the case. There's plenty of instances of actors and directors who didn't necessarily love each other, but respected each other enough that they were willing to work with each other multiple times because they knew they got the best out of each other. So I just don't see Give it. me some famous examples. Jaws is an obvious one. Mm -hmm. and everything you hear about young Spielberg versus Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfuss, and Roy Scheider, it's not like nobody liked each other at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously that movie winds up being one of the all-time greats. And Spielberg winds up working with um, Dreyfus several times after that close encounters he does right after that with him I always imagine the Godfather set to have been difficult mm -hmm. just because Brando was who Brando was yeah and yet you know Coppola basically manages to leverage him gets the best out of Pacino you know gets the best out of De Niro a couple of years later and like and, then, and yet, like De Niro and Pacino would then not work together again for over two decades because mm -hmm. they were too big of rivals, basically, to share the screen. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at those and I'm like, but clearly in the moment, they were like, yeah, we, we understand the, the magnitude of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, Fincher's a great example, right? That he's notorious for the 90 to 100 takes. Um, wow. <laughs> which nobody, which, you know, Matt Reeves, we heard the stuff about the takes, but like, yeah, yeah I told you yeah. that. The opening scene of Social Network supposedly was shot 90 times. Um, and yet, I think Rooney Mara's worked with him like four times. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what you're signing up for. Yeah. You know he's going to demand perfection. But if you keep going back to him, it's because you think he gets the best out of you, even if it's a nightmarish process. Yeah. Um, so Fincher's another one that I that I think of in, in that regard. Speaking of speaking of the Godfather, I'm looking forward to seeing that movie that they they're, they're doing. Um, well, I guess with the making of the Godfather. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, that, that'll that's be, that'll that, be that's going to be interesting. Um, our last topic, uh, Doctor Strange two. We saw the trailer for it for um, After No Way Home. Instead of an end credit, we got a trailer. Which again, I, I hope they continue doing um, moving forward with uh, new movies that they'll be uh, uh, that that'll be coming out soon. Um, Brian, we've called this um, Marvel's attempt, and they have called it as well their attempt at uh, horror. Um, there seems to be obviously a lot happening in this movie. Uh, a lot of questions that could be answered in this movie. Um, one of them being, will the multiverse get resolved after this movie? Um, is the character in What If the same guy in this Doctor Strange 2? Um, there's a lot of questions, uh, certainly a lot of excitement uh, for this film. Uh, where do you, in terms of excitement, Brian, where are you with this film? And do you think this movie is going to be big? And what do you think we'll be seeing? I think it's going to be big. Um, I think this 
it's interesting. So uh, my theory on my theory on the actually putting out the full fudge trailer was was obviously that um, Sam Raimi is directing Doctor Strange two and, and yeah. was the director of the original Spider Man trilogy. So it was a nice way to tie off No Way Home. I, I like. I went back and watched this trailer a couple of days later, and I liked it more. I feel like in the moment in the theater, it was kind of tough to have enjoyed No Way Home as much as I did. And then like watch this at the end of it and mm -hmm. feel like I had to get re-excited for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I kind of liked it better when I had a little more space. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think it's going to be big. The, I do think it's Strange Supreme from What If, who's at the end of the trailer. And that is that alone makes me uber excited because that was my favorite part of What If. Mm -hmm. um, and also begs the question, you know, if, if he's there, is is uh, Jeffrey Wright's watcher somewhere lurking in yeah, live action, be, film, oh, man, which I've be, always kind of sus oh, been suspicious would be the case. Ah, oh, man, if they do that. Right? So that, that alone kind of makes you interested. I, I think the, the, the scope and the scale of this is will be interesting to see. We obviously see Mordo carrying out his sort of vendetta against um, sorcerers. Mm -hmm. And I think we see Shumagorath, right? Very briefly. That mm -hmm. looked like Shumagorath, that tentacled creature yes. that was yes. attacking him. Although some people saying that is not is not it. I don't know. I don't I don't know what's going it on. Look like him. I don't know. Yeah. So they showed that. Um I guess we're meant to believe. So the other thing I was trying to figure out this movie was originally supposed to be out before No Way Home. Mm -hmm. But then in the trailer, they're trying to make it seem like it sounded like the ramifications of his spell in No Way Home is part of what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Hence which the reshoots. May, which may lead, which may all be contributing to why the reshoots on this have been so extensive. Yeah. Is this thing may have gotten a little bit out of order and now they've got to kind of fix things a bit, especially mm -hmm. with the new director. But no, like I, I'm, I'm super excited. I think, I think, you know, it, it was nice to see all the kind of the main characters back and, you know, I think, like I said, I, I just, the what if thing is the thing that really hangs over this for me. Oh, and then obviously we get to see um, the tie into WandaVision, right? Because they literally reference yes. Westview. Yes. Um, and you see her, I assume she's still reading the, it kind of looks like she's kind of reading the Darkhold again mm -hmm. in, in the trailer, which is exciting. So we're, I think we're assuming we're going to pick up that storyline, which is great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely excited. I feel like I'm not as excited as I am for the Batman. Oh, of course. You know, if the Batman's got the top spot, I would say this is probably right now on that like number two spot. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and I think it's good that there's a couple of months in between them. But Doc Strange one has aged better than I would have. Like when I first saw it, I was like, oh, this is fine. It's entertaining. Mm -hmm. It's good. Mm -hmm. I think it's aged pretty well. I think like Cumberbatch post that, like what he's been able to do in the Avengers movies and and now a little bit no way home like i think like he's been set up a little bit better i think for for the future so now i'm yeah. a little more excited in, in what the sequel has to offer yeah i don't know where's your excitement on this yeah I, very similar to yours it's definitely my number two uh i think it's going to be huge um there's going to be massive easter eggs in this film in this film and i and i and i'm looking forward to it very much and i've been you know saying this for quite some time that dr strange 2 is, is a huge film um because we don't know what the hell is going to happen um we certainly have some ideas and theories but there's no real clear how does this get resolved situation or how we, we don't we don't we don't see um where this is going to end up um who which characters it will introduce um what will be the ramifications of it will it will it um be resolved uh in this movie um or what sort of ending will we get there's a lot of questions to ask a lot of um, things to speculate on but i'm certainly looking forward to this film as many of you are as well um yeah, that's our show for today. Um, please hit remember to hit that like and subscribe button, hit the notification bell, um, and share with your friends and comment in the comment section below. Um, Brian, this week is a uh, Boba Fett, the 29th. I'm mad. See, man, I, I watched The Witcher. I, I I watched it in probably like two or three days. Starting the New Year's off, man. You should have at least given us two episodes, man. 
it doesn't seem like we're getting a second episode. Is it just one or two, or, or are we getting two? Do you know? I think it's just one. I think it's just one. That's, that's disappointing. And I like what we what I've seen so far in the trailers. Yeah, no, I think we're ready. Like I said, we're ready for some Star Wars. Um, and uh, I think we're ready to see the, the the history of this character unfold. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely ready for this show. And uh, yeah, you're right. We don't talk about The Witcher, but I've been very pleased with season two. I'm a little behind you. I haven't finished it yet, but I like season two better than season one. So highly, highly recommend that. Um, if you want to see, if you want to see an enterprise which uses Henry Cavill correctly, watch The yeah. Witcher. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, Brian, but for me, I don't know what Boba Fett's character has been using on his skin. I don't know if it's cocoa butter or aloe vera, but he looks clean. <laughs> well, he's a clone, so. <laughs> yeah, but in the previous version, in, the pre- in Mandalorian, he looked like, a, you know, you can see the scars on his face. Here, he looks brand new. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, but yeah, that's our show for today. We'll see you next time on the next Gen- on the Nerd Gen Report.